Good morning. Uh, just wanted to uh, remind you that we do have the uh, public rosary today at 1 o'clock at the Weesbrook Farm. Uh, there's more information in the bulletin if you'd like to uh, join us. Um, also, and I didn't quite get this in the bulletin this week, but it will be in next week. Um, this summer, uh, starting next Wednesday, so not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, June 8th, I will be giving a series of talks uh, on the important uh, documents of the church of the last 150 years or so, especially focused on the Second Vatican Council, because I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding um, about what is such an important part of our faith. And so I'm going to be walking through these and kind of explaining how these uh, sh have shaped our faith. Uh, so these talks will be on Wednesdays uh, from 6 to 7 in Blanchardville. And so uh, please join me for those. So we're approaching the end of Easter time with the Feast of the Ascension this weekend and Pentecost next weekend. And these two feasts are intricately linked. Christ ascended into heaven to pave the way for us, but he did not leave us alone. As we hear in today's gospel, Christ asked the disciples to wait in Jerusalem and, and pray until they were clothed with power from on high. This is the coming of the Holy, Holy Spirit on Pentecost. And as hopefully you saw in a video earlier, uh, Bishop Hying mentioned that this time of prayer and anticipation has led to the popular Pentecost Novena, which began yesterday and continues until next Sunday on Pentecost. You may have picked up last week, and we have more in the back. We have these uh, prayer cards to go along with the Pentecost Novena. And so I urge all of you, as Bishop Hying asked all of us, all the Catholics of the Diocese of Madison, to join him every day. He has a video every day uh, praying the Pentecost Novena, and that uh, the prayer will be at the end of those uh, prayers. So please join the bishop and all of the Catholics of the Diocese of Madison for this important Novena. And it's important for us to remember that when Christ left the disciples, he gave them a mandate which continues to us today. We hear a shortened version of it in our reading from the Acts of the Apostles. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Another version of this is the conclusion of the Gospel of Matthew, what's called the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, until the end of the age. Again, this message is not only for his disciples 2,000 years ago, but it pertains to us as well. When we are baptized, and more so when we are confirmed, and the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we are all given this commission to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, I know for most of us, this doesn't literally mean traveling around the world as missionaries, converting pagans. As with all things, it starts locally. We have to convert ourselves first, then our families, and then our communities, etc. So we have to think, how far have we gone individually? I think I can say without fear of contradiction that as a society, we have failed miserably at just that basic first step. We have failed at teaching the gospel in our families, and thus everything else beyond has failed. Now please know I am speaking here broadly, generally. I know that many of you have done an excellent job in teaching your children the faith, and for that you will be greatly rewarded. In general, however, our nation, which used to be a bastion of Judeo-Christian values, has failed for at least a few generations, and we are now seeing the devastating effects. In his 1995 encyclical, in Evangelium Vitae, which means Gospel of Life, Pope St. John Paul II coined the term culture of death to speak, in contradiction to the Gospel of Life, about our modern society. 
Now, the Pope's main concern was with preserving the sanctity of life. We must promote life, the dignity of each and every life, or our society will continue to plunge into an abyss. This has always been the message of God, the Bible, Jesus himself, and the Church. In his encyclical, JP2 especially affirmed the Church's teachings against murder, abortion, contraception and sterilization, euthanasia, and for the limited use of capital punishment, since all of these contribute to the destruction of the sanctity of life and the growth of the culture of death. Evangelium Vitae built upon previous teachings. It wasn't in a vacuum. In particular, we should revisit the immensely significant and prescient encyclical Humanae Vitae of human life by Pope St. Paul VI in 1968. Coming shortly after the Second Vatican Council, this document was controversial at the time, even hated by many Catholics, because it reaffirmed the Church's teachings on so many areas of sexuality and family life. Those who wanted the Church to, quote, get with the times, were upset that the Pope was saying things that were so backward. If only they knew, as we should know now, that everything Paul Paul VI warned about would become true and then some. Humanae Vitae is another of those texts that every Catholic should read because it speaks to so many important issues that continue to plague us today. And I promise you, it doesn't take long to read, maybe an hour at most, but it's well worth your time. We have to remember the time that this was written, 1968, following two devastating world wars and in the middle of the Cold War. The world was going through massive upheaval, and as much as many would like to dismiss it, the sexual revolution was doing at nearly as much damage as the world wars. Now, I can't get into everything he speaks about, but Paul VI focused largely on the proper expression of conjugal love and the dangerous role of contraceptives. He reaffirmed the beauty of married life, an integral part of God's design for human life. He called for a greater awareness of self-discipline and chastity. And he also included four predictions that have all unfortunately come true due to the increased usage of contraceptives. Number one, a general degradation of sexual morality and increase in marital infidelity. Number two, the loss of respect for women, that they will be seen by men as, quote, a mere instrument for the satisfaction of his own desires, no longer considering her as his partner, whom he should surround with care and affection. In other words, men and women will see each other as objects to be used rather than humans with inherent dignity. Number three, governments with the false claim of overpopulation will enforce or at least allow contraception, sterilization, and abortion. And number four, the tendency for men and women to think that they have absolute dominion over their bodies, including procreative powers, rather than understanding that our bodies are a gift from God and thus belong to him. Now, I hope that all of us can see how these predictions have all come true and the massive damage that they have done to all of us especially our younger generations. We as a culture have lost the respect for the dignity of human life. We have forgotten that each human is made at the moment of conception in the image and likeness of God, the Imago Dei. And today, especially on this Feast of the Ascension, we celebrate how God took on human flesh and how he died, rose, and ascended into heaven to lift us all up. Our image of marriage and family has been warped and destroyed to the point that many people have forgotten the eternal truth that marriage is between a man and a woman only, that it is for life, and that it is for the sanctity of the other and the procreation of children. More and more families are broken, and is it any wonder that more and more children are emotionally scarred? Is it any wonder that young people especially see each other less and less as humans worthy of life? 
Is it any wonder then that incidents of violence among the young have seemingly skyrocketed in recent decades? That suicide rates among the young are alarmingly high? That gang violence, murders, are so frequent in cities like Chicago that they are basically not reported? If you ever look up crime statistics in Chicago over a weekend, you will be shocked by how many shootings there are. That young people can be so twisted that they would target innocent children in an elementary school or innocent grocery shoppers. And I could go on and on. Now, I'm not saying that this is the only solution, but we have to start by embracing God and life again. We have to do better at teaching our young that their lives matter, that other people's lives matter, that God is real. And that he died, was resurrected, and ascended into heaven for love of us. We have to do better at teaching the beauty of the inherent dignity of human life, made in the image and likeness of God. All of the laws and restrictions won't do anything until we get back to the basics. God loves you. We all should love him in response and love each other because we see God in each other. We must remember that Christ is victorious, that he reigns now in heaven, and that God has given us the means to join him eternally. This is the joy of the gospel that we are called to share with everyone out of love. Without these moral truths, we can never reclaim the culture of death to the gospel of life. I will conclude with part of Bishop Hines' message that he gave this week in light of the recent shootings. Now is the time to affirm the inherent dignity and worth of every person, to take steps to break the culture of violence in our country, to live out the gospel of life, which proclaims that every human being has the fundamental right to be born, to have a loving family, to receive the nutrition, nurture, love and care we all need to flourish, to live free of prejudice, racism, fear, violence, and the destruction of the common good and the communal bonds which we hold, which hold a free society together.